Welcome to the Free Library. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. A mere 17 years ago, a slightly younger writer by the name of Gary Giddens presented the first installment in his biography of Bing Crosby, A Pocket Full of Dreams, The Early Years. A national bestseller, the book prompted a writer in the Atlantic Monthly to opine, Giddens is so persuasive that even the most skeptical post-boomer should close the book with the eerie sensation that it's Bing's world after all, we just live in it. In the intervening years, Giddens has written a number of well-reviewed books, including Warning Shadows, Home Alone with Classic Cinema, Jazz, written with Scott DeVoe, and he released a number of collections, notably Weatherbird, Jazz at the Dawn of Its Second Century. The author of the National Book Critics Circle award-winning Visions of Jazz, and a jazz columnist at the Village Voice for 30 years, Giddens later directed the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the CUNY Graduate Center. Remarkably, he has won an unparalleled six ASCAP Deems Taylor Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Peabody Award in Broadcasting. Drawing on scores of interviews, along with unprecedented archival access, Swinging on a Star, The War Years, 1940 to 1946, is the second installment of his multi-part biography of America's quintessential crooner. It's an honor to have him back. Please welcome Gary Giddens. I thought I'd talk a little bit about how the book came to be and then read some passages and then uh, uh, open it up for questions uh, on any subject you like. Um, this book was not the book I set out to write initially. Uh, after the first volume came out, Mrs. Crosby invited me to the uh, house in Hillsborough. She had refused to speak for me, with me during the nine years I, I wrote the first volume. And believe me, a lot of people tried to bring us together, but she just wasn't having any of it. Crosby had been uh, written about very negatively uh, in, a, in a very bad and unresearched biography. And then uh, his son Gary published a book that really, uh, the problem with that in terms of Bing's reputation is partly the fact that nobody read it, but everybody heard about it. And uh, you know, as Gary would say in his defense, it's not about my dad, it's about me, it's going my own way. But what the publisher did, and Gary didn't realize it until the book came out, is because they made a sale, a lucrative sale to the National Enquirer. Um, the editor um, went through the manuscript and took all the really, really terrible stories about Bing's discipline and, and spanking and all of that, and they front-loaded it into the first chapter. And uh, that became the Enquirer piece. And uh, when you read that, it's really quite grueling. And uh, then, but if you follow it, if you read the rest of the book, the a motif that runs throughout it is, uh, you know, we did a recording session together and I screwed up and I knew Dad would be very upset, but he wasn't. Or we, we went, we were on a film set or something and I said something and I knew he was gonna, he was gonna, you know, yell at me, but he didn't. So it's a, he had a complicated relationship um, I talk at length in the book about um, Bing's uh, extre extreme discipline. And for me, one of the big themes of this volume is the irony that he gave everything of himself, certainly more than any other performer and maybe any other individual uh, outside the White House during the war, um, to entertain young men and women uh, in the armed forces, put himself in harm's way, uh, worked relentlessly, um, but could not bring the same empathy that he had for all of these extraordinary men who put on a uniform um, to his sons, who he thought he was raising in a certain way that would bring out a kind of character that it was important to him and that in a way mirrored the way he had been raised uh, in Spokane. In any case, the first volume came out and uh, Bing's uh, son, Harry, from the second marriage, called uh, Mrs. Crosby and said, uh, this is not what you think, you should read the book. And she could not have been more gracious after that. And she invited me to the house, and I got a chance to go through all of Crosby's papers, um, his dictaphone belts, 
um, letters, business dealings, uh, the one journal he ever kept, notes that he that he wrote in his later years when he thought about writing a second book, uh, just extraordinary material. And one of the most extraordinary facets of it to me were the thousands, certainly hundreds, but I think it was probably thousands of letters um, that he received from servicemen during and right after the war. But even more remarkable to me um, was that so many of the letters were from the parents, the wives, fiancés, siblings, friends of servicemen who had been killed. And they were in this terrible moment of mourning and they feel an obligation to write a letter to Crosby. And all the letters say how much their son or or husband uh, loved his singing and collected his records and and but I would say the majority of them were about people who had seen him in France uh, when he went over there or in England and uh, wrote home these enthusiastic letters about their shock at being so close to the front lines and uh, here comes Bing Crosby to entertain them. Uh, in many instances, the first USO uh, performer they had ever seen. And so um, they took photographs on their little cameras and sent them home. And a lot of these letters that came to Bing had copies of those photographs in them. Some of them are reproduced in the book. And uh, as a consequence, I began to realize that there was uh, so much about Crosby that was new to me that I didn't know. Um, the first book is um, uh, somewhat of a conventional biography in that it's based on uh, the two primary sources open to biographers when you write about somebody who is living not that long ago. Interviews with those who knew him, worked with him, related to him, and uh, public information, you know, the letters that you can get, uh, various accounts that were written, and so forth. Um, but here I had I was inside the house and I could not believe what I was seeing. I was reading very personal letters to Crosby and from Crosby, because he kept all of it, um, that nobody else had ever read. And so uh, as I started going through the, the uh, materials, I started to think about the fact uh, that nobody, there were very little literature, there is very little literature on the home front and on the whole concept of a home front, but particularly the home front of the Second World War. Um, I've read dozens and dozens of books about the Second World War, and it's always bugged me that you look in the indexes and they never mention Bing Crosby or Bob Hope or any Dinah Shore, any of the performers. They never mention the USO as though it were of no real significance. Um, Tolstoy talks about the law of retrospection where people look at what seem to be the important aspects of a historical moment, and then they write about them as though they were all deliberated so that they would come out the way history tells us it came out. But he goes at, at great length to prove how ludicrous this is. And when you're writing biography or history, you realize that uh, there's a certain amount of arbitrariness in what you choose, but at the same time, um, there were different perspectives. The only way you can really get what's going on is to find your own perspective. And I thought to do a book about the USO, uh, I'm sorry, from the home front from the perspective of a USO performer and, and uh, the context of that as a background for the, for the life of Crosby seemed to me really uh, perfect. And initially, um, Little Brown was very much opposed to me doing a book just on the war. Um, and my agent said, I was upset about that. My agent said, Gary, what do you care? By the time you're finished, that editor will be, have been fired. And, and, and that's pretty much what happened. And, and, and uh, a new editor came in and he requested the book. And I said, you know, this book is only about the war years. And he said, oh, I didn't realize that. I have to get permission. And I said, well, unlike your predecessor, you don't have to go to the top naked. I can give you the first three, almost 350 pages I'd written by then. 
And uh, he liked it, and Reagan Arthur, the head of the Little Brown, liked it, and so they gave me the uh, go-ahead to do a book. And I must say that they really um, surprised me by the beauty of the book, if you've looked at it all, the fact that they did color and papers and color in the photography and the whole layout and the care with which w we nursed the book. It was finished in the fifth day of January 2017, and I thought it would come out at the end of the year. And um, they said, let's not rush it. You've spent so many years on this. And uh, they really, it, it was really a wonderful process, finally, finally, for the most part, finally getting the book out. Um, there are a lot of themes that come into this. Um, how do you know a band? How do you write a biography? What, are, what can you know? One of the th things that biographers debate all the time with each other and when we teach is the, uh, the line between the knowable and the unknowable. And because we're all stubborn and because we all know that if, you, if you're Pa patient and persistent enough, you do find things that people tell you you will never find. I mean, because of the amount of years I spent on this, a good, good number of people who refused me interviews repeatedly changed their mind. In a couple of instances, they were women who, who knew Crosby romantically, and they wouldn't talk to me until their husbands died, because they thought their feelings would be hurt. And uh, there were other reasons why th things turn around. Um, Universal, which owns the Paramount Library from before 1950, is the one uh, studio that would not make any of its paperwork available. And uh, I had some very influential people make calls on my behalf, and finally somebody from there called me and said, look, I'll burn it before you'll see it. And uh, I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, because it's all ours. Why is it anybody else's business? I said, these are about movies made 60, 70 years ago. I'm a, I'm a qualified biographer. Why would you want to burn it? So he sort of backed up, but he wasn't backing off on, on sending me this stuff. Well, to my absolute astonishment, when I went uh, one of my many trips to L.A. to research, I went to the, uh, the Margaret Herrick Library, which is if you're writing about anything relating to the movies, is the, the great archive. And I asked uh, to see if there were any new papers on certain films, and I'm seeing envelope after envelope of stuff I never thought I'd see, and sure enough, before Universal uh, basically cracked up, they just sent cartons of this stuff over to Margaret Herrick, and I was like, that's a good thing I waited, see? My, my readers might not agree, but for me it was, uh, you know, that was a big thing. So let me, let me uh, uh, talk about a couple of the themes in the book. Um, one for me, there, let me say two because they're, in, they're connected. There's a circularity to this narrative, um, which I realized early on and which really excited me because I wasn't anticipating it. One of the, th the, t one of the things I discovered about Crosby going through all the personal papers that I never expected to find, I had done over 300 interviews and I had never gotten an inkling of the fact that he went into a kind of uh, creative and personal depression in 1940-41. This was the so-called uh, phony war era before Pearl Harbor, between the invasion of Poland and uh, Hitler going into the Low Countries and, and then finally America coming in with Pearl Harbor. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he asked his wife for a divorce, which is how the book opens. He later rescinded that. He gave up his ability to make uh, independent features, which he had fought for years to get from Paramount. He really wanted to get out of his craft music hall. He loved radio, but he was just he was just basically tired of the business. He was tired of being famous. He was uh, sick of his own voice. This is the only period in his life that I've ever seen anything like this. And then, after Pearl Harbor, he gets this incredible sense of mission. It transforms him utterly, and suddenly, he tears off the toupee and all the, the Hollywood stardust that's attached to him, and he commits himself completely to doing whatever he can for the war effort. And uh, it's an extraordinary story. He traveled more than 50,000 miles. Um, he never 
turned down the smallest group of soldiers to perform. He was a re regular at the Hollywood Canteen. One of the things that I enjoyed doing this book is so many things that you hear about, but you don't really know what the stories are. I didn't anyway. Like the Hollywood Canteen, a really interesting background story, or what were the this? How did they come about? And why did they come about? And what was the point of the ASCAP strike, which meant that nobody could play on the radio or perform uh, any song by an ASCAP composer? And how did that in influence American music? Because suddenly, to replace them, a lot of composers from the South and other rural areas, rhythm and blues artists, country artists, who could not get into ASCAP suddenly were very were launched. Crosby helped to do a lot of that. So there was that, um, this, this circularity takes uh, a form in that at the end of the war, even though he's been transformed, the same problems bugging him at the beginning are still there. He's in a troubled marriage. He hates the fact that he has to do craft live, and he's determined to change the entire radio industry into a pre-recorded medium, which he did do. Um, and uh, he wants more control about his films, which he's easy to get because during the war he has hits that are reached levels that n had never been seen in Hollywood before. Not even Gone with the Wind had grossed the way Going My Way and Bells of St. Mary did. Over the time, of course, it did, but not, a, not initially. And um, um, I was fascinated by the fact that he is transformed by the war. He's made it, it, it profoundly affects him, and he has now a different way of going about handling some of the very issues that um, had had struck him in 1940-41. So um, one of the themes, um, one of the things I loved about Crosby is that he was uh, uh, way ahead of the curve in terms of civil rights. Uh, he really believed in live and let live. Um, he helped the careers of many black performers, um, put them on the radio routinely, performed with them before that was acceptable. and. Um, uh, he, he really, uh, despite the fact that he did bl blackface in a couple of movies, which he grew up with, um, he was always getting awards for racial amity and things like that. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the transformative moment that I'm about to read. Um, it begins with uh, Pearl Harbor, the, discover the, the news breaking on December 7th, and, uh, and then you'll see. Sunday in Los Angeles dawned bright and sunny with temperatures in the middle 70s. Toluca Lake residents raised their windows to catch a gentle breeze. Some returned from church in anticipation of a lazy day, tuning in afternoon broadcasts, including two from New York, Arthur Radzinski conducting the Philharmonic Non-Aggression at Work. The program consisted of Shostakovich and Brahms, and the Dodgers crushing the Giants in football at the polo grounds. Announcers interrupted those programs with reports of a Japanese attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Many Americans wondered what, where, or who is Pearl Harbor. The announcers spat out the headline and returned to the broadcast in progress, but the reports kept coming. Up and down the West Coast, including in Toluca Lake, where pedestrians were usually as rare as elk, people walked outside to commune with their neighbors, looking up or seaward, because they did know something about Hawaii and fully expected bombers or submarines to cover the 2,500 miles between them and the islands. There was no cordiality, the celebrity photo photographer Gene Lester recalled. Everybody had worried looks on their faces. That night, California, and especially Los Angeles and San Francisco, plunged into hysteria. Men with rifles and rocks shot or smashed marquees and shop lights, demanding blackouts. Soldiers and police obeyed orders to lock down Japanese neighborhoods. Crowds blocked streets and bridges. Fists and insults were hurled and rumors ran riot. By Monday, Roosevelt's day of infamy was confirmed as Chir Churchill's fin final climacteric, guaranteeing the salvation of Brit Britain. America was in it now. Kraft Music Hall enlisted directly. The December 11th broadcast opened with Irving Berlin's fundraising ditty, Any Bonds Today. One skit, skit featured the actor Robert Coote, now a flying officer of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Another had Victor Borger expounding on language inflation. And a third found Veronica Lake joking about her peekaboo hairdo. 
However, the show's primary guest was Paul Robeson. And on Monday, Ed Helwick, one of the writers on the show, had been asked to write that segment. I should point out that Robeson had been on the show frequently. Crosby was a great admirer of his. Um, but he, the, well, I think I've, it's all in the narrative here. The big question that Helwick and Kuhl had to discuss was how would Bing and Paul address each other? The question arose because after Robeson appeared on the show in February, Ed and Cal happened to flip through a, a pile of fan mail and found a letter that in Helwick's recollection read, the next time you have that black bastard on your show and you don't call Crosby Mr. K Mr. Bing, we ain't gonna eat no more Kraft cheese. The letter was signed, the employees of the Southwestern Gas and Electric Company, Shreveport, Louisiana. Cal Kuehl, the producer, buried the letter. It did not merit a response, and there was no reason to bring it to the attention of the head of the uh, J. Walter Thompson uh, organization which sponsored Kraft Musical, let alone the Kraft Phoenix Company or Bing. Neither did he want to chance a boomerang in the South. So he told Ed Helwick not to mention any names on the show. Don't let Bing call Robeson Paul, and don't let Robeson address Bing by name. Helwick was appalled. Crosby, he said, was totally colorblind about his clothing and when it came to booking guests. That was one of the things we so admired about him. As for Robeson, he was the most impressive man I ever met in my life. His voice came right out of the bowels of the earth. But he obeyed Cal's instruction. During the program, Bing introduced Robeson, and I quote, equally at, ho equally at home in the Broadway theater, on a Hollywood soundstage, and particularly on the concert platform, Paul Robeson's presence in the old craft music hall this evening really makes it a music hall, for Paul Robeson is certainly one of the world's truly great artists. He sang two signature numbers, Water Boy and Old Man River, and he read the name-free patter as written. Bing interpolated the word Paul in every single line of his dialogue. For the finale, he brought Robeson back to lead the cast, announcing we're all standing together for the Star Spangled Banner. One of the, um, the themes of the book is that Crosby had a tremendous influence on ideas about masculinity in that period. He was, he represented something very different from the norms of masculinity as represented in Hollywood by actors like Clark Gable and Gary Cooper or Humphrey Bogart. There was a stoicism about him that was very appealing in those years and an aloofness that was also part of it. Crosby was never sentimental or pious. That's one of the things I most admire about him. Um, never sentimental. There was always a sort of straightforward way that he approached people and, uh, and, and issues. And so as a consequence, he became sort of a, a guide to how to behave in a home front. And so as, by 1943, as many as 50 million people tuned in every Thursday to the Craft Music Hall to find out about uh, collecting scrap metal or cloth or ways that you could deal with the uh, gas rationing, and, uh, and ways to deal with the men who had been sent abroad, the children of many of the listeners, his listeners. Um, he came to be associated with a kind of reliable virility, and he was somebody who was never comfortable with doing love scenes, but in the 1930s, he was somebody who made romantic comedies and musicals opposite some of Hollywood's great leading ladies. And uh, he was moving, because of the war, I believe, into a different kind of persona, which really came to its fulfillment when he put on the priest garb for Going My Way in Bells of St. Mary, which sort of ruled out the, the possibility of a romantic clash, but allowed him to become um, 
you know, the, the supermensch, uh, a kind of a, a, a figure of unbelievable reliability, of almost supernatural powers. I mean, if you want miracles, Father O'Malley turns a bunch of juvenile delinquents into a vocal choir. He turns a would-be streetwalker into a loving wife and mother. He turns a, a, a irritable old man, played brilliantly by Barry Fitzgerald, into a mama's baby boy. Um, and one of the things about the movie that completely freaked out a lot of uh, people in the censorship bureaus who tried to cut it out was that the movie very definitely states that he had a... Uh, a sexual romantic relationship before he became a priest. This is one of the great themes of the film that nobody wanted to deal with, which is that like Augustine, he has a choice to make and he makes the choice in the favor of the priesthood and he never turns back. And the woman uh, with whom he, whom he had known in St. Louis and whose career he encouraged is played by the famous uh, opera singer, uh, Risa Stevens. Anyway, this is um, a little bit about the uh, the idea of masculinity and the way it helped him to craft his repertory of songs, particularly when he went overseas. I, I'm, I've been talking about the fact that he had a great uh, ability to write letters. Um, a really extraordinary. It's a very difficult thing. It's, it, con writing condolence letters and, and responding to fans is not literature per se, but it's hard to do. That, which is why the people at Hallmark have a very good living. And, uh, but Crosby was superb at it. He was very understated, he was straight ahead. All the qualities of the Crosby persona come out in those letters. So that's what I'm referring to in the first phrase here. Understa understated strength was inseparable from emotional reticence in his letters as it was in his music. Yet in the context of the times, that combination wielded tremendous authority, as characterized in a letter to Crosby from a transport commander stationed in Antwerp. He wrote of that quality in your voice, which strikes to the bottom of the hearts of men. I have watched it happen often, not just in the rare case, but in many, many thousands of men, sitting silent, retrospective, thoughts flying back to home and loved ones. He empathized the singer's power to soften the heart of the man who so shortly after goes back to shoot down his brother man. And he said it was a determinant in helping to keep, and I quote, our boys from turning into the beast they are asked to be. This, he said, was something big, something too big not to have you know and understand. The power of music put into humble, throbbing words as these fellows want it, need it, bow to it. This strikes a surprising counterintuitive note. Despite the tears generated by Christmas anthems, Crosby is rarely singled out for the emotional tenor of his music. Emotion verging on vulnerability is a quality we associate with Billie Holiday and Frank Sinatra. Being expressed inborn virility, secure and stoic, he did not invite listeners to inspect his insecurities. Dinah Shaw caught the distinction between him and Sinatra. Bing never pressed, she said. He was always in tune. His phrasing was basically very good jazz phrasing, and yet he could also sing a great ballad. I don't know if he could make me weep like Frank could make me weep. Ballad singers like Frank, you empathize with them and your heart breaks because you're experiencing their heartbreak. Bing didn't do that to you. He had simplicity. It definitely had style, but there was no affectation. When he talked, it seemed like something he thought of at the moment, totally inspired. And he could do that, he could get that quality in his singing, totally off the cuff and inspired. Bing was great, but he wouldn't let you see, see that deeply into his soul. Crosby's reserve was at the core of his success with the troops, on the air, at army camps, and in the fields of Europe. To sing to men separated from families and lovers and often starved of sexual companionship, he had to create a particular kind of bond, a zone of emotional safety. A zone has boundaries. Crosby's USO repertory faithfully stipulated what they were. For once, his customary aversion to I love you songs flattered the occasion. 
Restraint carried more weight than amorous histrionics. He did not tour with any conventional love songs of the kind tendered by a guy to his gal, the kind that Sinatra successfully recorded in 1944. Such songs, I fall in love too easily, a lovely way to spend the evening, night and day, Nancy, Saturday night, are aimed at women, not masses of lonely men, and could serve only to remind them of what they were missing. Bing sold millions of records of love songs that year. Sunday, Monday, or always, I love you, people will say we're in love, miss you, moonlight becomes you. And yet, he left them all at home. The only songs he carried to war worked on parallel levels. The only love songs he carried to war worked on parallel levels of nostalgia, I'll Be Seeing You, Easter Parade, and Exotica, Sweet Lilani, Amour Amour, which he interspersed with the rhythmic humors of San Fernando Valley and Swinging on a Star. He nurtured the emotions of male bonding, something evident even to his 11-year-old son, Gary, who when asked by a New York Times writer what he and his brothers thought of Sinatra, answered, he's good, but the way we feel about it, he sings for girls. Pop, he's got a voice that men like. A few months earlier, one of Crosby's childhood idols, John McCormick, wrote in the same vein to a reporter. Some of our favorite records here in Dublin are those of my old friend Bing Crosby, who incidentally in his own line is by far the finest artist of all. His work is clean and manly like himself. I spoke about how much he gave himself during the war and I want to read a couple of um, excerpts. All right, so I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Freckleton, the Freckleton disaster. Very few people have. Um, very few people in Britain have, um, because uh, when it happened, uh, Churchill uh, demanded that there be a completely blockout on all news coverage. It was so terrible that he thought it would just destroy British morale. Um, that's just, a, it's in, Freckleton is in northwestern England. The most strenuous day of Bing's British tour began several hours after the canteen show when he and his USO troop boarded the night train to Preston, 200 miles north in Lancashire. Cars brought them to the nearby village of Wharton on the northwest coast. It was now September 1, the war's fifth anniversary, though no one thought to commemorate that miserable occasion, made all but unendurable at Wharton, an Air Force modification center, and its neighboring community of Freckleton. A ghastly accident had occurred on August 23rd. Two American bombers, B-24 Liberators, took off on a test flight from the Wharton Aerodrome, then known as BAD-2, Base Air Depot Number 2. They were recalled because of dire weather, but one pilot ignored the urgency of the command and flew cl too close to the ground in a fiercely blackening storm. The plane lost a wing, and the fuselage smashed through Freckleton like a locomotive, raising three houses, the Sad Sack snack bar where 14 servicemen died, and the infant's wing of the stone cottage like Holy Trinity School. 61 people were killed, 38 were children between the ages of five and seven. Five children were carried to the base hospital at Wharton. One died the following day, and another, the last casualty, died shortly after Bing's visit. The other bodies, many burned beyond recognition, lay under linen sheets awaiting identification and were eventually buried in a mass grave. Several had been relocated to Freckleton to escape the German air attacks in London. Incredibly, Freckleton grieved alone. Military censors curbed coverage, and no accounts reached the London newspapers. Crosby was told, on arrival of the incident and of the four living children in the base hospital, and he asked to visit them. First, Bing's troop had a 10 a.m. show for which several thousand BAT2 flyers and other personnel crowded into Hangar 6 and 7. Between that and the evening show, he visited the burn ward to see the four children, two nearly completely hidden by bandages. The three who survived faced years of pain and reconstructive surgeries. Bing, for once, lost it. Ruby Whittle was five years old at the time, but six decades later, she remembered how he had sat on her bed holding the fingertips of her otherwise bandaged hand and asking if she would like him to sing. She knew two songs that her mother liked, White Christmas and Don't Fence Me In. 
but the sight of us lying there was too much for him. He couldn't sing a note. He stood and walked into the hall and steeled himself. Then he returned to the doorway and sang both songs standing there. Ruby recalled, it's a strange memory to have, but a good one, because he was a very nice man, and he was genuinely saddened by what he heard of the disaster and seeing anyone who had survived. He visited adult survivors as well. A member of the RAF who had suffered extreme burns at the sad sack recalled the surprise of seeing him at his bedside, determined to lift his spirits. The chaplain for the 300 and 81st Bomb Group, Lieutenant Colonel James Good Brown, introduced himself to Bing at the show that evening. I had quite a conversation with Crosby before the show began, as he was waiting for the men to get the stage arranged in the proper manner. He thoroughly enjoys going around to the war camps and bases. To him, it's fun and a patriotic duty. He feels that is the way he can do his part in the war. Neither did I hesitate to tell him that I thought he was doing as much good for the men as the chaplains, to which he remarked, not quite as much good as the chaplains. From what I understand, um, Bing had to teach Jolson how to use a microphone. Well, I think uh, uh, that's not, an, I'm sure he helped him a lot because uh, they did a ton of uh, radio together in 1946. Two of uh, Bing's early idols were Jolson, whom he saw in Spokane when he was 12 years old, and of course, Louis Armstrong, who he met in 1926. And one of the great achievements is that he was, as Artie Shaw said, he was the first hip white man born in the United States. And what he meant by that was that he was the first one to understand what time was. And, and he, he and Armstrong became uh, great friends from that point, and they influenced each other, actually. But uh, Jolson had been on the radio for many, many years before he worked with Crosby. Um, however, he was shouting a lot. And in order for them to do duets, he had to accept the fact that the microphone, I mean, the microphone made Crosby. I haven't even begun to talk about Crosby's influence in technology, but he was basically the first guy to take a microphone out of a radio station, put it on a stand, and use it on stage. Um, that allowed the kind of singing that became known as crooning. Uh, and, and the book talks about the fact that he you know, financed the invention of tape, had the first tape-based studio in, in the world. Uh, you, you mentioned Sinatra, uh, who came to great fame in this period and was a very different sort of singer from Crosby. Uh, what did Crosby think of him? I know it's a big question, but uh, I'd like to hear about um, that. Crosby was extraordinarily generous to him. He liked him. He admired his singing. Um, they both uh, sort of... Uh, wanted uh, Jimmy Van Heusen to be their songwriters, but you know Frank Sinatra at that point was uh, Tommy Dorsey's chattel, and Bing Crosby was the king of Paramount Mountain, so it wasn't much of a choice. But uh, after 20 years with Crosby, Van Heusen did eventually go to Sinatra. Um, he uh, there's a wonderful story <laughs> that he he introduced Sinatra around and gave him some good advice that Crosby said probably saved his career. Um, but one time, uh, Bing was doing, uh, I forget which film he was making, but uh, Sinatra was in town, and, uh, oh, I know, Yank Lawson was playing trumpet in the, in the ensemble who knew Frank, and he told him that Crosby was filming, and he said, can you get me in? So he called Bing, and everybody knew that Sinatra was going to arrive. So the crew and the cast decided to play a little practical joke. And the minute Sinatra walked onto the uh, soundstage, everybody swooned and fainted to the ground. <laughs> and Bing's first response was to crack up. He loved nothing better than a good joke. But when he saw how, how upset Frank was, he started walking around and kicking everybody and saying, what the hell are you doing? Get up, that's not right, you know? So they, that, that, there was that. Um, he did, however, um, he, he was appalled by Sinatra's lack of discretion. Uh, in his uh, romantic flings. He had the same problem with Bob Hope. He didn't mean what, mind what people did in private, but he thought humiliating your wife was over the line. And uh, of course, later he became involved in a relationship himself. But uh, that did cause something of a, and of course the temperaments were entirely different. I mean, we think of Sinatra in terms of the Rat Pack in Las Vegas being spent lots of time in Las Vegas, but he would never perform, not once, never sang one song, because he didn't want to be a front man for gamblers. And he had a very strong moral feeling about certain things like that. How did he get to Europe? How did he get there? 
on the Ile de France, which had been turned into originally a POW uh, ship and then a troop ship that every couple of months would make the trip to Greenock, Scotland, unload 12,000 servicemen. Um, the whole thing about the USO was it was top secret. Nobody knew, not even the performers knew where they were going. Crosby went to San Francisco with the troupe to rehearse what kind of a show they were gonna do, but he was certain, because they were in San Francisco, that they were gonna be sent to the South Pacific. And in fact, he made, he, he, he contacted people he knew on the Hawaiian Islands, which would be the first stop. He was planning to socialize and see some old friends. And uh, then the, the, basically, the, Two days before boarding, he gets the call that uh, they're expected to be at the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard in two days and le uh, departing on such and such a ship. And as he later said, that's when I realized we were going to be a part of Ike Eisenhower's show. And uh, he got on the Ile de France. Nobody, in the dead of night, nobody knew they were on board. But every day there was a paper published on the boat. Um, and uh, the next uh, morning it said, yes, it's true. the rumors are true, Bing Crosby is on board. And he did uh, four shows every day uh, in different parts of the ship um, and uh, lived like the guys did, you know, ate their, w refused to eat the officer's mess, wanted to be with the, the men. The only, the only liberty he did take part in was having an after, uh, early evening drink, but, um, uh, he also had suffered from severe uh, seasickness, and, uh, which he denied, but there's no question about that. <laughs> there were too many witnesses. He didn't like to be thought of as somebody who would be uh, um, uh, vulnerable to that. But it didn't change anything. I mean, he just, he just performed every day without, uh, without fail. Do you have an insight as to why Bing Crossley didn't... Uh, like recording later uh, live and went to tape. What's, what was that transition or, or that? Yes, well, one of the things Crosby did um, during the war was he made more, I, I, think, uh, I think he actually tied with Dinah Shore for making the highest number of uh, AFRS broadcasts, American uh, Armed Forces Radio Service. And, uh, these broadcasts, with a very, very rare exception, maybe one a couple a year, could not be broadcast in the United States. The whole point of getting all these incredible stars to work for nothing was that they would only be broadcast, they would only be heard abroad. And the way they were heard were on 16-inch transcription discs. And the discs would be sent to troop ships, uh, army camps all over the world. And Crosby thought they sounded pretty good. and and. Uh, he knew that uh, the, the kinds of recording that were basically available up to that point were not good enough to do a radio show, but these seemed better. So he kept that to himself. And then at the end of the war, um, he decided uh, that he was going to, uh, uh, he, he was going to insist on doing a pre-recorded show. It gave, he, he thought it would improve the show. First of all, you could edit a pre-recorded show. So if there was a fumble or a mistake, you could just cut it. Um, second, you could, uh, rehearse. You could improve the material. You could, if you came up with a good idea, you could do it, edit it in. Uh, in the course of this, he invented one thing. I find it hard to forgive him for, but nobody's perfect. Um, he did one broadcast for Philco when they went pre when they started working on uh, not tape but uh, transcription disc. Tape still hadn't been uh, perfected. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I saying? He, they had not figured out how to invent tape. They had figured out how to build the tape recorder, but the 3M company, which created oxidized tape, had not yet figured out how to do it. So they had a bunch of rolls of tape that had been taken back from Germany and France, where the Germans had built the first tape recorder. And they just used them over and over and over and over again until 3M finally came through with tape. So they come, they finish a program and it's like, a minute and a half short, which is almost unheard of because in radio it has to be on the second, it has to go right to the station identification break. And they, they're, they're sty stymied and they don't know what to do. And Bing's great uh, audio engineer, Murdo McKenzie, who was a great innovator in this field, said, uh, I have an idea. Here's a, we have one tape that consists of just nothing but applause and laughter. 
So they taped it in after each number, and that was the beginning, of course, of uh, canned laughter. Other Hollywood um, stars were in combat, uh, enlisted, and, and was he, I'm not clear on, was he in the service when he did this, or was no. there a question of him enlisting, no, or I'm not using the right words, but. No, I understand. He, um, there was no way he could be drafted. Uh, he was uh, over the age, he had four children, and he was colorblind. But he said, I'll do whatever I can do. And they didn't want to draft him. What, what would be the point of that, when, what, considering what Crosby could do for the armed services? But interestingly, they offered him all kinds of uh, you know, military regalia. They, like Glenn Miller uh, was uh, first Captain Miller, then he became a major. And Bing thought that was very pretentious, and he just refused it. He said, I'm, I'm going out as Bing Crosby. I don't want any kind of... Uh, you know, he, he really was extraordinary in that respect. One of the things he did that all of the soldiers who wrote to him remembered and commented on is that when he performed, initially officers would come and take the good seats, and Crosby would not go on until they left. He said, I do this show for the enlisted men. The, you officers are our guests. And he would have the enlisted men come up front. Um, he... he uh, didn't like applause, he didn't need it. And he, uh, on radio, that was one of his big arguments. He, he hated opening applause. He said, I haven't done anything yet, why would they be applauding? I mean, can you imagine what he think of today's uh, talk shows at night? Um, so, uh, he, you know, he had that put into his contract. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. When you listen to old radio shows, the, the, the Crosby shows are very, much more modern than most of them. A lot of them are hard to listen to because there's so much dead space of applause and laughter for jokes that aren't funny. But the Crosby shows really spin along. Now, he couldn't stop laughing. If he says something funny and everybody laughs, it's there. But, you know, somebody will come out, a classical cellist, and play some amazing number, and then it goes right into the, the next uh, chat. Um, there's no applause. In fact, somebody walked out at the beginning of every show telling people. Save the applause. You can applaud it at the end. I've been enjoying the, this mosaic collection of uh, Crosby's radio, the CBS radio performances. Small groups, very intimate, kind of relaxed. And I'm wondering what kind of band did he take with him on the, what, you know, well, who did he perform with on the ship or in the, oh, in on the USO tour? Yeah, well, what kind of band were they? Was it a big um, or was it? They were called packets and they were usually groups of five. And uh, Bing had an accordionist and a guitarist for, that was the only instrumental support. And then he had two women, one was a singer and one was a dancer who also sang. Oh, and I forgot the comedian, Joe Dorita, who ended up as one of the Three Stooges. So, they they worked out you know um, comedy routines. They um, and then for the singing he would uh, he would be accompanied usually by Buck Harris the guitar player occasionally uh, I, maybe the accordionist but mostly the just the guitarist. He had such good pitch, and he had amazing time. I mean that's the you know I remember interviewing a drummer who worked with him for a few years, and I said his time is really incredible, isn't it? And he said, you want me to tell you how great Bing's time was? And he leaned in and he said, he had Basie time. That's like the, you know, the ultimate, Count Basie. That is, he practically invented time. And, uh, and it's true. I mean, uh, you know, I, a lot of musicians, I uh, was very surprised, told me that they, they loved listening to Crosby during the war years and afterwards because he was the only white guy on the air who had time. And so they learned a lot of the songs from him. You know, they were, even even Sinatra, if you listen to, if you know his work in the 1940s when he was with Columbia, he did three, in eight years, he did three middle or up-tempo numbers, all the rest are ballads. And he had to really, when he reinvented himself, he, he reinvented a, a kind of rhythm that worked for him and is very effective, but it's not the, you know, it's not jazz time, and Crosby really understood that. Uh, this kind of predates this book to your first book, but being you're in Eddie Lang's hometown, um, I see you mentioned, I just was. I just got the book tonight and was perusing, you mentioned Kitty Lang. I thought I knew everything about uh, Eddie Lang, but I wasn't aware of her relationship with the family that you mentioned in the book. Oh, goodness. Lang was, was Bing's... Eddie Lang uh, mural, if you haven't seen it. 
I'm sorry? There's a mural of Eddie Lang on 7th and Fitzwater. You should oh, take is? a ride by. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, Eddie Lang was one of the people who invented jazz guitar. And uh, he was a remarkable musician, and he died unnecessarily and tragically at the age of 30, uh, undergoing a tonsillectomy, which he took at Bing's encouragement because um, uh, Bing had just made his first feature film. It was a huge hit, and uh, Eddie's in it accompanying him. It's one of the only two pieces of footage of him. And Bing wanted him to have a major, like, you know, sidekick role in the next film, but his voice was like this. And uh, so he got a tonsillectomy and they uh, butchered him. They just, pure medical incompetence. When I wrote the first book, Kitty Lang, uh, his widow, who became uh, Dixie's closest friend and, and friend of the Crosby's all her life, um, she, she had a feeling that it had been a medical incompetence, but she couldn't prove it. But there's a I talk about it in this book in the source notes. Six months after my first book came out, um, a, a doctor uh, spent a couple of years investigating it, and he pretty much proved that uh, he was butchered on the table and just allowed to bleed to death. Um, it's clear to me, anyway, that this book enhanced your admiration of Bing Crosby. But did you, reading his private letters, did you discover or come across any... Um, any dark side or any um, something that you found unpleasant about him? Unpleasant? Yeah. Um, I think that the unpleasantness that I had to deal with was mostly about what was going on in the house. Um, the discipline, his absenteeism, um, the difficulties of the marriage. His, his wife became a, a, was a serious alcoholic and became a recluse. Um, but in terms of his dealings with people, I think he's amazing. Um, he always gets what he wants, and uh, and he's almost always right. Um, you know, he he was always helping people. When he heard somebody was down and out, he in who had been an old timer, a vaudevillian or something in Hollywood, or or his wife, uh, the wife of a performer, had just given birth and they were going to need some money, he would uh, call the producer of whatever film he was making and saying, uh, "You need uh, this guy to be the elevator man in that scene, or or you know, to be a waiter or whatever, just to get them work." Or if they were still active performers, he would put them on craft, which paid very well for guest uh, appearances and on a couple of occasions uh, I mean one occasion he walked in and the guy he he recommended wasn't in the elevator and uh, Crosby said what's the matter you couldn't get him and I said I thought why bother we've got all these people under contract and Crosby said I'm gonna go play golf call me when you've changed your mind and uh, the same thing when he did uh, the movie Waikiki Wedding. He became friendly with Harry Owens. And Harry Owens was a band leader, famous band leader in Hawaii. And he wrote a song for his daughter called Sweet Lilani. And Crosby said, that's a fantastic song. Well, I'm going to put that in the movie. And the producer, no way. You know, we have a contract with these songwriters. Same thing. Call me when you change your mind. So they changed the mind. And it was nominated for an Academy Award. And I got Crosby's first gold record. Um, he's very good about that, the way he deals with people. Um, he's incredibly, uh, he's, he, one way he changed my life was his punctuality. I, I found it as a kind of personal challenge since I never had been. Um, Crosby was always 15 minutes early for everything, uh, but he insisted on leaving, exactly. I mean, they could be in the middle of a scene, but at five o'clock, if he had another appointment, he was not gonna be late for that. So everybody was willing to, to accept that. Um, I, I, you know, I, he was no saint. He never pretended to be. Far from it. But he, uh, he was a, he was a, a better than a good man. And I think, in some respects, in terms of his public persona, he represented the best um, that we had. He is the only performer I can think of, ever, who completely unified. Uh, the entire audience of the country. I mentioned earlier that on Thursday nights as many as 50 million people turned into his program. You have to remember that there were only 150 people living in America then. That's one out of three. That's an amazing number. And uh, he, um, you know, the, he wasn't a favorite of young people 
or old people. He was, he was, you know, he had young people, college, high school, their parents, their grandparents, everybody loved Crosby. There was no gender distinction. Women loved him. Initially, he was, they made fun of him because women, you know, fainted when they heard Bing Crosby, which was nonsense. But as I've shown, uh, he was even more important to men, particularly during the war. Uh, he, he overcame every ethnic uh, division. He was the first white performer who's routinely programmed on Harlem jukeboxes. Um, Lena Horne said that when she first went back, after a few years in Hollywood, went, went back to New York, she said uh, black people loved Bing Crosby. She said they liked Billy Eckstein too, but they loved Bing Crosby. And uh, they're really, you know, he, he had this quality um, that he didn't judge, he wasn't judgmental. Anthony Quinn said to me once, he was the first person I ever met in Hollywood who didn't treat me like a mex. And I heard that from a lot of people. I heard that from a gay uh, choreographer who said, that, you know, you didn't have to pretend anything in his company. If he liked you, if you were straight forward with him, um, you know, he accepted you for who you were. Um, except for uh, Rochester on uh, Jack Benny's show, the longest running uh, black performers ever on a so-called white mainstream show were the Charioteers, a rhythm and blues uh, gospel group that appeared on Crosby's show for the entire duration of uh, Kraft once they, once they entered the program. And uh, so he's, um, I, 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 I'll tell you something. After almost 25 years of research in Crosby and interviewing hundreds of people, my big uh, revelation was that he was a lot more like what most people thought he was like in the 1940s, 50s, 60s than what people came to think about him later. Anybody else? Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>